Hello, welcome to Eat Pop, the diet in the paintings of the Song Dynasty. This is the final episode of this series. Before I start the show, I'd like to thank you all for following me through for this amazing journey. We've seen paintings and objects that told us history about food like tea, sweets, pastries, fruits, and there are a whole lot more arts on the website for you to click and learn. This broadcast wouldn't make it without you. And this online curation is brought by the National Palace Museum with much help of the open data. If you like my broadcast and online curation, don't forget to vote for me between October 21st and November 4th. That's enough about the competition. And now with me, Carmen Chu, your hungry host, I'm with the show. After so many food, what couldn't be better than washing down the throat with a glass of wine? You're absolutely right. Today we're talking about wine. First, I'd like to show you this big bowl of Hua Liao chicken noodles. No propaganda intended, but any sane Taiwanese would definitely know what I'm talking about. It's not just any instant noodle, but the showstopper product produced by Taiwan Tobacco and Liquor. The amazing ingredients that come along with the noodles are Chinese herb. A bag of big chunks of chicken breast and a small pack of Huadian wine, the secret to this popular food. When pouring hot water into the bowl, you immediately smell the strong fermented fragrance of the wine. It's a comfort food for every lonely soul in the midnight. Holding in my hand is a glass of homemade brewery, Mam's Plum Wine in a very posh martini glass, the one like Double Seven Stage Catchphrase. It's not very alcoholic, but the fragrance and sweet and sour taste, perfectly expressing the very essence of the plums. And no, it's not an olive, but a plum. Who needs an olive when you can have a plum? Why such magical drink, isn't it? Poets, painters, musicians, writers, and artists have dedicated their talent to the eloquent remedy. Wine has played an important role when it comes to the religion as well. For example, Christians and Taoism present wine as tribute. During a more socialized event, wine is surely not to be missed. So I'm sure you would be familiar with the topic of this painting, Wen Hui Tu, painted by Song Hui Zong's time once again, our talented emperor. This work represents scholars gathered for a feast at a table under large trees by a pond. Beside the table are some servants preparing tea at a small table and a stove. Zoom in and take a closer look. There we see tall and big pots of heating water, and the middle servant is whisking tea with a long-handled spoon. This is exactly Dian Cha Fa, the proper way to make tea during the Song Dynasty. At the big table, we see how lavishly the food and utensils are painted: food, flowers, tea, and an admirable amount of tableware are laid. But here's the question: When I first saw this painting, which one is exactly for drinking wine? I had no problem identifying the teaware. For example, the woman in the green robe in the top row is holding a tea bowl with saucer in her hands. I'm sure you would agree with me that this is no doubt for drinking and serving tea, as the Song people would lift both the bowl and saucer when drinking tea. For a banquet like this, with emperor and the most erudite scholars, there will be wine, of course. Well, the problem is, teaware and wineware looked very similar at that time. They would both had a bowl, and the bowl would stand on the saucer, which usually is lifted. With a rising bottom. As I did more research, I then learned that for the teaware, the saucer would have a deeper sunken area in order to hold the tea bowl, so that the bowl wouldn't topple over when pouring the hot water and whisking the tea broth. The sunken saucer is designed especially for the unique Dian Cha Fa in the Song Dynasty, and for wineware, there isn't any whisking technique involved. Therefore. The saucer is usually flat. Another interesting viewpoint is that on the big table we see two tall pots. As you now know, they are not teapots, as the Song people don't brew tea with tea leaves in a pot. 
As a result, these pots could only contain hot water. But it is my humble opinion that these two pots are for wine, as the hot water should only stay on a servant's small table. I feel very lucky to find that in the National Palace Museum there are actually one porcelain teapot that looks almost the same as the one in the painting. One thing about the Sun wine pot is that the people then didn't drink cold wine. Instead, they preferred warm, and so usually the wine pot would bathe in a bowl of warm water to help heat up the wine. The bowl is called zhu wan, and is usually shaped in a lotus flower. Notice a narrow bottle under the servant's small table. That's mei ping, which literally means plum bottle. It's a fashion to use this bottle during the Song Dynasty. And the bottle was first used exclusively for plum wine, but thanks to the elegant look, the bottle would be used not only for other wine, but later on as vases. Well, it doesn't matter if you really take a tea bowl or pour wine in it and drink it without holding the saucer, right? What really matters is the wine. So, what wine are we drinking if we were to live in the Song Dynasty? Well, it depends. During the Song Dynasty, it was the national law that banned civilians brewing their own wine. Wine is tightly controlled by the royal and could only be produced inside designated officials. If civilians were caught brewing wine privately, there'd be severe punishment, like death. However, as you know, my listeners could feel this was a bit too harsh, especially for those big restaurants and pubs. Well. The good news is, harsh as the law was, some restaurants were granted the privilege to make their own wine, provided that they purchased the yeast from the state exclusively. This was to make sure that the officials could tax the purchasers properly. Other smaller business could also buy wine from these big restaurants and sold without breaking the law. It sounds almost like today's tobacco and alcohol retailing. Doesn't it? If you really had the chance to go back to the Song Dynasty, make sure you go to one of those extravagant restaurants in the capital city. Talking about top-priced wine, you could have Gao Yang Zhou, which li- literally means lame wine, and it cost about six times a regular meal would do. I was particularly interested in this expensive wine, so I looked into it. It appeared to be made by first braised a good amount of fat lamb until the meat was in the putty, and then added some more herbs and cooked again. Lastly, mixed the putty with yeast and cooked rice or millet, and sealed everything for about ten days. The whole gooey thing fermented to be this beautiful Gaoyang Zhou. And people praised it for its smooth, mild, and delicate flavor. It really opened my horizon because I never knew that meat could be an ingredient for wine. What my friends said this was bad news for those vegetarians. There were other pricey options too. According to Wu Lin Zhou Shi, there was a record of Qiang Wei Lu, which literally means "dew of multiflora rose," but I don't think any rose is involved. Liu Xiang, Xuan Bi Si Xiang, Si Tang Chun, and others. Each area boasts their own brewery. If only counting the wine made with fermented grains, last time I checked, there would be an estimated thousands. Impossible to name all of them here, and these are simply the expensive ones. But hey, if you are short of some money and just want to get drunk with your mate, a simple glass of Bai Jiu would do. Bai Jiu, Huang Jiu, which literally means white wine and yellow wine, are two big families of wine, and they have nothing to do with grapes or any fruit. In fact, they could be both categorized as fermented liquor, and both were made from grains like rice, millet, sorghum, wheat, depending on area and tradition. White wine is distilled, while yellow wine is not, and so it will look a bit murkier. And some would even take a darker color. The famous Hua Diao Zhou and Shao Xing Zhou, both are dark and strong liquor, can be categorized as yellow wine. 
The family of white wine expands widely across northern eastern Asia and farther to Taiwan and more southern countries. Different names are given, but all referring to this big family. You must be familiar with the names like soju and soju, and indeed they are the variants in Japan and Korea. I'm sure you will also know sake, a light rice wine from Japan. Not just one thing is that no matter what you're drinking, yellow wine, white wine, sake, soju, or shoshu, these Eastern Asian brewery are slightly different from the Western people know of. It's the process. Eastern Asian rice wine would first turn the starch in the grains to sugar, and the Western wine would start ferment the sugar that is already in the fruit or ingredients like grapes and sugar cane. So. If you were to have a night out with some mates during the Song Dynasty, white wine and yellow wine are perfect for a tight budget. But smart people would know a better way to make uses of these liquor. If you are thinking about adding wine into cooking, you are absolutely right. In Zhong Kui Lu, a book written during the late Song Dynasty, we see evidence of Chinese cooking with wine. Zheng Shi Yu, or steamed shot fish. Involves seasoning with huajiao, soy sauce, scallion, and most importantly, the wine. Shad fish is not the only seafood that requires wine for seasoning. Zui xie or drunken crabs should be made with seven bowls of wine, three bowls of vinegar, and salt. According to my mum, the best cook I've ever known, wine is quintessential for cooking any seafood. You wouldn't want that terrible smell. Fishy and putrid, so you put wine, wine which washes every smelly thing away and brings out the essence of seafood. The essence she was talking about will later be verified by Japanese scientists who named it umami. I dig more into Zhong Kui Lu and learned some more menus required wine. Zao Rou Jiang or making gravy. Includes pouring much wine with herbs like fennel and dried citrus peels, so the gravy could ferment. Huang Chue Jia, or minced fermented siskin bird, is to marinate the siskin birds with yeast, salt, shredded scall scallions, and wine in a big clay jar. The birds would be preserved for a long time and eat a few ones at a time. When I was a child. It's a tradition that my father's family brewed our own rice wine. Having a great amount of rice paddles, it seemed dumb enough to buy rice wine from the government. Every winter, I was looking forward to seeing the whole process. I remember the distilling process would take a few days. The small barn would smell terrible first, but then gradually, the huffing and puffing clay hearth started emitting the beautiful drunken fragrance. My family relies heavily on homemade rice wine, which would play an important role for the New Year dinner and also the tributes for gods and ancestors in the following festivals. When I grew up, we lost the land, and we couldn't brew our own wine anymore. Such a shame! I never tasted any rice wine better than before. This is the final episode of this series of the diet in the paintings of the Song Dynasty. When I gained much insights and ideas from digging up the recipes and scrolls, I hope you enjoy my voice and food just as much as I do. I leave you here and urge you to get a bowl of Hua Diao Ji Mian, and maybe I'll see you in the future. <laughs>The Diet in the Paintings of the Song Dynasty is a podcast produced and hosted by Carmen Chu. The music is provided by YouTube Audio Library, a free database where you can make use of no copyright music. This podcast is also released with videos on YouTube, where you can find the links in the show notes below. Each box is part of the 2020 online curation competition held by the National Palace Museum, and you can hear this broadcast on the NPN websites, YouTube, Apple Podcast, and Spotify.